The following WCIA3 special presentation is sponsored by INB, Inman Place, and University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Now from WCIA3 News, Central Illinois Hidden History, honoring Black History. Good evening, welcome to Central Illinois Hidden History. I'm Paul Chikin. And I'm Jennifer Roscoe. Tonight we are taking a look at some events in black history rarely discussed, which impacted our lives here. We're standing at the Bruce D. Nesbitt African American Cultural Center on the U of I campus. Now this new building opened less than a year ago here in Urbana. It's a place that provides a network of programs and support services for Illinois black students, faculty, staff, and alumni. African Americans have made great contributions to our country for centuries. Some of the names we know, others we don't, but are very much part of our history, whether we know it or not. Coming up, we're going to look at some of black history's hidden moments, the ones not talked about as much, but still with lasting effect on generations to follow. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive is one of the most recognized street names in Decatur. But before 1988, it was known as Broadway. It wasn't until two men and a community rallied behind them to change that. WCI3's Jamie Mays has more. For some people in Decatur, this may be just another street. But for James Taylor and Bill Oliver, you got to be proud. You got to be thankful that God sent somebody like that. It's something much more. That you would never thought that this should happen. But 32 years ago, it did. The name of this street change to honor a leader of the civil rights movement. Oliver and Taylor helped make it happen. They were active in the movement. And we were driving places and we could see streets named Martin Luther King. And we was in Chicago driving down Martin Luther King. And he said, why don't we have one of these streets in Decatur? So they started the process. The street name they wanted to change at that time was named Broadway. And they chose Broadway because it runs nearly the entire length of Decatur all the way from the north side. Through the center of Decatur, over five miles, all the way south to Lakeshore Drive. We got some uh, petitions and started down at the lake and went all the way MLK up to Mount Road and, and got every house along, every house and business along that street. Everybody that lived along Martin Luther King didn't sign for it. But there were some businesses that were up in arms about it. We have to change all of our stationery. We got stationery that's good for a year, two years, three years, and this is very expensive. Oliver says some opponents called the street dirty, but said Broadway was already a historical name. In order for it to happen, city council had to approve, and Bill Oliver was on city council, the first African American to be elected. In the end, city council voted against it, six to one. But Oliver and Taylor didn't give up. Bringing more people into the to the movement in order to get people from all over, not just people on Martin Luther King, from all over the city. Then something else happened. Gary Anderson was elected mayor. And so through his leadership and change of the council itself, we were able to get it passed the next time around. This time, the vote was six to one in favor of the change. Finally, in January of 1988, the signs were replaced from Broadway to Martin Luther King Jr. Drive. The man that is named after has meant so much, not only to me, to Jim, to Decatur, to the state of to the nation, to the world. Every time I go down this street, I think of what it, what it means to me, and I hope it would mean the same thing to all the people in the city of Decatur. For Hidden History, I'm Jamie Mays. The street name was changed in Decatur almost 20 years after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Coming up, I think you know hard work will get you uh, most times where you want to go. And that was exactly the case for the NFL star. How Roger Craig high stepped his way from the Quad Cities to the Super Bowl. When you think of Hall of Fame athletes that are African American and born right here in Illinois, some may come to mind are Ricky Henderson, Jackie Joyner Kersey, and Manny Jackson. One who was born and raised right across the river in the Quad Cities is Roger Craig. 
former San Francisco 49er won three Super Bowls with the team, and his legacy extends far beyond the football field. Josh Vinson tells us how. Roger Craig is best known for being a legendary running back with the San Francisco 49ers, playing alongside greats such as Joe Montana and Jerry Rice. But here in the Quad Cities, he's best known for being a hometown hero who always gave back to the Quad Cities that made him who he is today. He didn't forget his community and he didn't forget his high school. He bought shoes for an entire team. Uh, amongst other things, he's, you know, he spent money uh, where, you know, I, I mean, he might have bought himself a new car, I don't know, but, but he didn't forget people here. Coach Flynn, who was an assistant coach at the time, says Craig was very talented, but he also was just as impressed as to who he was off the field. I think the thing that you can learn from a, a person like Roger Craig is, uh, number one, he didn't get where he has been just on talent alone. He worked hard. He worked hard all of the time, and it didn't make any difference what sport he was involved in. And so I, I think, you know, hard work will get you uh, most times where you want to go. Working hard and being humble was instilled into Roger Craig since he was a little boy. His older brother Curtis guided him and helped shape him to be the man that he is today. Roger says he owes his success to his older brother. By, by some of the things he helped me with is, is work ethics and, and, you know, working hard, you know, working harder than the next person that, that I'm, I'm competing against, you know. It was his lead that, 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 that taught me all the things in life that's going to help me in life, you know, not an athlete, but in, in the corporate world as well. Craig says he wants the younger generation that's coming up now to understand what you put into life is what you'll get out of it. Just believe in yourself, believe in your team, and, and work hard. And just, you know, just work hard and just, just know that hard work will bring you greatness. You know, and if, if you don't understand certain things, you know, make, uh, you know, ask questions from leaders, from, from the team, or from the coaches or whatever, you know, Learn as much as possible, you know, so you can be the best that you can be, you know, when you step out of that football field. It's life lessons like those that anyone, regardless of their profession, can use to be the best at what they do. Roger Craig says it's important to have a mentor in addition to having a great work ethic. He said he learned a lot from Chicago Bears great Walter Payton. Coming up next. Out of each one of those um, hymns that we do, it has a message. It's a form of song known as call and response. How one group is keeping history alive through their music. Music has played a major role in the history of African-American churches. For more than 100 years, hymns have provided messages and music. And as music has evolved, so has the traditional sounds inside churches. But one group has found a way to keep history alive through their music. Dee Griffin has more. Go preach my gospel, said the Lord. Bid the whole earth my grace receive. Inside Greater Mount Canaan Missionary Baptist Church, an old art form has taken on new life. Out of each one of those um, hymns that we do, it has a message. The Disciples of Praise do what's called Raising Hymns. It's a form of song known as call and response that dates back to slavery. Back in the slavery time, quite naturally, they didn't want them to know how to read, so they couldn't read. But but as it went older and older, you may have the preacher or some designated one that, you know, would read it. Or they may not then have a one book. The hymns fall into categories of standard, common, metered, and long. I like, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, 
or whether shall I go. As instruments have increased in popularity during services, this form of music has seen a significant decrease in many churches, but it's been just the right beat to keep this group in harmony. And what's so unique about it is a bunch of men from different backgrounds, from different churches come together and be able to coexist. While raising hymns has become a dying art, this group is using it to keep history alive. If it dies, then they'll never know about their history. And if you don't know where you came from, then you, you don't know pretty much where you're going. For Hidden History, I'm Dee Griffin. The Disciples of Praise also travel to various churches upon request. Coming up next. You need to do something about this shooting and all this domestic violence that's going on in our city. And they do it with kindness, compassion, and encouragement. How these three kings are trying to change the course of black history in Vermilion County. An organization focused on promoting peace has only been around for a few years, and already they've made big strides in changing the course of black history in Vermilion County. In recent years, the community has been filled with gun violence, and quite a bit of it is black on black violence. That's why the Three Kings of Peace are ruling with kindness, compassion, and encouragement. The hope is to stop the recent trend toward violence and help create a community that everyone is proud to live in, no matter their skin color. WCIA3's Emily Braun shares their story. These are the men known to Danville as the Three Kings of Peace, Edward Butler, Frank McCullough, and Jerry Hawker. These three work tirelessly to correct a common issue shaking their community. You said, man, we need to do something about this shooting and all this domestic violence that's going on in our city. A high rate uh, has been black on black crime. So we're trying to do our best to, to let uh, folks know that, that we ought to have love, or that we ought to not treat each other that way. And especially now during Black History Month, as they acknowledge this is not just happening here. Dr. Martin Luther King probably today would be uh, rolling over in his grave if he knew uh, all that he'd done to try to bring peace, equity uh, within our community. Uh, and he see that uh, we have resolved and uh, you know, killing each other, you know, especially in the black community. The Kings believe the way to solve violence is love, community engagement, embracing youth, and in the way the group started, faith. Well, let's find the set seven locations, and at that time we'll do set seven prayers and do it for seven days. A lot of what they do has a biblical reference, and everything they do is based in faith. These men contribute a substantial amount of time working in schools and with kids. It's been an unbelievable experience of the interaction that these gentlemen have created with the schools. It's working. And uh, we find kids jobs, uh, you know, and uh, they, they, they get out on a job after 16. A student, he said, man, here come the three kings. The group also organizes community marches and orchestrates any way possible to change someone's life. There's opportunities out there, and the Three Kings are in, in, the, uh, in the scenes trying to uh, talk to all stakeholders. And a big part is honoring the legacy of one of their founding members, Bobo Smalls. Yeah, Bobo, Bobo was uh, the elder of us all. Uh, he was a gentle person. Speaking of marches. He was uh, one of the ones that would march with Dr. King. Jerry Hawker knows as the newest member of the Three Kings, he's marching in some pretty big shoes. Well, it's it's humbling for, for number one because he was such a uh, giant figure here in Danville and everybody knew Bobo and the kids especially. But he's determined, as are McCullough and Butler, to show that there is more to their kingdom than meets the eye. To show that uh, the Three Kings of Peace is a community, not just a black community, it's the entire city. And, and the area. In Danville, for Hidden History, I'm Emily Braun. The Three Kings of Peace also involve students in their mission. They're calling kids who come on board the princes and princesses of peace. Coming up. So the American Revolution then offers up this moment of choice. 
Long before the Civil War, African Americans were in the middle of another conflict. How the American Revolution brought us the forgotten soldier. As a part of Black History Month, we're highlighting different places around the country that have stories that may have never been told before about African Americans in our history. One of those comes from the Revolutionary War and the fight for independence. Tamara Scott shows us inside the Forgotten Soldier exhibition at the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown. When we think about the Revolutionary War, many people think about our victory against the British Army and the beginning of our country as we know today. But there are some faces who don't always get remembered. The faces of the African Americans who also fought for their lives and for their freedom. Well, here at the Forgotten Soldier exhibit, curators are hoping that you remember the part they played in our future and you shift your gaze. We're trying to tell stories that have been forgotten since the American Revolution and tell a more holistic, more complete story. And that starts here at the Forgotten Soldier exhibit at the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown with who's believed to be the very first martyr Crispus Attucks. He was a mulatto, uh, which means he was a man of mixed race, mixed heritage. He is the uh, one of those men who were killed the, the evening of the Boston Massacre. Looking at Paul Revere's engraving of that massacre, you see Attucks, who not only made the ultimate sacrifice for our country, but also set the tone for the African-American sacrifice. Something like 50 percent of Virginia itself um, was enslaved. Uh, yeah. um, and so that's a, um, a very large part of population that doesn't always have an avenue out of that mm -hmm. institution. Right. Curator Kate Egner Gruber says this is where things get complicated. So the American Revolution then offers up this moment of choice. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're getting at as we move through the gallery here is that African Americans, both free and enslaved, during the, the years of the Revolution have choices to make. Sometimes those choices are made for them. To stay enslaved and fight with the Patriots or leave and fight for the British Loyalist. Fire! One man highlighted here, the last colonial governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, sets an example of the options for blacks in this time. He offered slaves the chance to serve in exchange for their freedom. That promise is alluring. And we know that many, many, many men, women, and children um, regardless of their intention to join the British Army, do show up to take advantage of Dunmore's proclamation, and that happens right here in Virginia. But records show those who made the move in hopes of freedom were challenged when the war ended. What happens to those thousands of African American men, women, and children who, uh, who take the British up on their offers of freedom, we can follow some of those stories through the survival of these two books. The Book of Negroes and the Inspection Roll of Negroes. This is the first time these two have been in the same room since the 18th century. This is where we meet Mary Perth, owned by a man in Norfolk, Virginia. Perth and her family, like thousands of others, have many unanswered questions. Article 7 stipulates that because the British lost, they have to leave North America. They have to leave, but when they do leave, they cannot carry off any property owned by Americans. Article 7 specifically says including Negroes. But one man known only as Mulatto Billy changes everything. He joined the British Army in hopes of freedom, but then is arrested later for treason. And he is actually found guilty and sentenced to hang for being a, a, a traitor. It's actually Thomas Jefferson who intervenes here. And he says that Billy, because he's enslaved, He's not free, therefore, he's not a citizen, and he has no political allegiance to anyone. Now, this is important, though, mm -hmm. because although Billy might have been made an example here, yes. it doesn't mean that every African American after him got the same treatment. That's true. Well, there's just so much history to learn here, but only for a limited amount of time. The Forgotten Soldier exhibit will be here until March 2020. Head to historyisfun.org to learn more or to purchase your tickets. Reporting in Yorktown, Tamara Scott.
By the end of the war for independence, anywhere from five to 8,000 black people had served the American cause in some capacity, either on the battlefield, behind the lines in non-combat roles, or on the seas. There are so many stories out there, we only have the time to highlight a few. More hidden history moments that are lying right in your backyard. I'm Jennifer Roscoe. And I'm Paul Cicchini. Thanks for joining us. This has been Central Illinois Hidden History, honoring black history. A WCIA3 special presentation sponsored by INB, Inman Place, and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign.